Um, welcome everyone to the uh, press briefing today from the IASLC uh, World Conference, Biomarkers and Personalized Therapy. Um, I'm Dr. Roy Herbst from the Yale Cancer Center, and I'll be your moderator today. Um, with us today, we have a number of distinguished um, um, uh, panelists um, who are going to tell us about some of their work uh, that were presented or will be presented here at the ISLAC meeting. We have, um, in the order that they'll present, Dr. Robert Perker, professor at the University of Vienna Medical School. Dr. Perker. We have um, Dr. Mary Leila Garcia, who's a professor at the University of Colorado School of Medicine. Um, on the same paper, uh, um, as they work together from a similar database, and you'll hear about that, Dr. Bruce Johnson, a professor of medicine at Harvard Medical School. Then we have Dr. Kelsey Thu, a researcher at the BC Cancer uh, Agency. We also have Dr. Raj Gervais, um, who's at the Centre Francois Basles, you see I'm, I'm an American, uh, who's a physician, he's here. And then we're, we're, still, we're still waiting for Dr. Bangshi, and um, uh, when, when Dr. Bangshi gets here, uh, that, that's the last presentation. So here's the way we're going to do things today. We thought it would be helpful to all of you to have a few minutes update on the presentation in case you couldn't make it yesterday. So we'll ask everyone using uh, at most five slides to summarize the, uh, the essence of their presentation. We'll then take a couple of questions after each presentation since some of the uh, panelists might have to leave before the end. But I am hoping that we'll have sufficient time at the end for an open discussion regarding these papers and other items related to targeted therapy. Now we've, we've learned a lot already in the first several days of this conference. And uh, clearly, uh, you know, if you look over the last decade, the field of lung cancer has clearly changed to one where we are treating patients in more personalized ways, using their tissue and molecular information regarding their tumor to treat them more effectively. And we really have had a plethora of papers that have demonstrated that. So the first, um, and I'll ask Dr. Perker to speak, um, is uh, abstract 1557. Epidermal growth factor receptor expression as a predictor of survival for first-line chemotherapy plus cetuximab in FLEX, a study patients of st patients with advanced non-small cell lung cancer. Dr. Perker. Dr. Roy Herbst, ladies and gentlemen, I'm just going to present to you now the results of our study on defining a predictive biomarker with regard to the use of chemotherapy plus cetuximab in patients with advanced non-small cell lung cancer. The FLEX study was the initial study was a positive study and it clearly demonstrated the survival benefit when you added cetuximab to chemotherapy in patients with advanced non-small cell lung cancer. Cetuximab binds to the EGFR on the surface of tumor cells and acts via blocking this receptor. Therefore, we were hoping that measuring the target, measuring the receptor levels might predict the outcome with regard to survival benefit for patients treated with chemo plus cetuximab. And we have used immunohistochemistry for assessing the target and that was prospectively done in all patients of the FLEX study. Here you just see uh, how we measure this. When you look to the right side of the slide, you see high EGFR expression. So we had divided patients into high EGFR expression and low expression. And high expression was present in 31% of patients entering into FLEX, since 85% of all patients with advanced disease were eligible for entry into FLEX. Overall, approximately 25 to 30% of all patients with advanced non-small cell lung cancer will fall into the category of high expression. So the question was, what does it mean with regard to the benefit when you treat patients with chemo plus cetuximab? And that's seen, shown here for patients with high HFI expression. You have a survival benefit when you treat with chemo plus cetuximab compared to chemo alone. And just taking the median survival times you have in the combination of 12 months versus 9.6 months in the chemo alone arm. And the one year survival, which I usually take for judgment of treatment, was 50% in the combination arm versus 37%. The next slide shows you that we have seen this benefit in the high but not in the low. 
EGFR expression group. So that's the slide that clearly shows that this is a predictive <coughs> biomarker. So if you have a low expression, no benefit. If you have a high expression, you have a benefit. So you have a so-called treatment interaction between expression levels and survival. And that's the interaction p-value which is significant. So that is how you define a predictive biomarker. I just showed two slides for adenocarcinomas, one for adenocarcinomas, where we see that in this subgroup, which is the largest subgroups, if you have high GFR expression, you have a median survival of 20 months versus 40 months in the chemo arm. So you gain quite a lot. And the same is true for one year survival, 65 versus 52%. The next is this Kramer cell carcinoma. Uh, here you also have a survival benefit. You have a 38% reduction in the relative risk of death. So this is a quite interesting and never seen before uh, benefit in this subgroup of uh, advanced non-small cell lung cancer patients. This just summarizes this once again. We had the initial FLEX trial, which was a positive trial. You see it on the left side of the slide. And now we were able to identify a biomarker that predicts those patients who benefit from chemo plus cetuximab. That's you see on the right side. And we, and we achieved this without increasing toxicity. So we have an improved benefit risk ratio. And I do believe that this is one of the major steps forward, particularly it will allow us now a personalized medicine, and in particular for these patients with high EGFR, which is approximately one, 25 to one third of all patients with advanced disease, we can achieve a survival benefit. I would like to thank you very much. Thank you, Dr. Perker. Uh, we're now open for questions. Uh, please come to the microphone, identify yourself, since we are recording. Um, I guess I'll start while we're waiting for people to come up. Dr. Perker, um, we could have left that slide up, Renee. Okay. Um, these data were, for Flex were first presented at the ASCO meeting 2009. Two questions. One, what took so long to do this? And two, what are the implications now for the future of cetuximab in lung cancer? Oh, that's, that's a question that a lot of people raise, but uh, many people, of course, and you know, there were. Uh, at the, we have to see this how, how things developed. Initially, we planned Im we immunohistochemistry. We assessed both the intensity and the frequency of, of staining. The initial, at, when, we, when the trial was planned at two, in about 2003, nobody was quite sure what is the best marker to select a patient. So we decided to do immunohistochemistry, which we believe was a good decision. During when we ran the trial, then other predictive biomarkers came up or were, suggest, were suggested. So when we finished the trial, we first looked into the frequency of expression, just taking into account positive or staining or no, no staining cells, and taking a, a percentage of 40%, below 40, negative, above 40, high, there was no difference. And at the same time, many people believed that for prediction of response or benefit, it has to be KIRAS analysis. So we did KIRAS, did not work. Then it was EGFR copy number analysis, fish analysis, and we were not able to uh, show a predictive value. And that led, again, to go into more detail in the assessment of this. And we actually had the results of were available for now for one year, or we got it roughly one year ago. We had to be sure that it's that everything is okay. To 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 uh, the data are clean, and in addition, uh, were, we wanted to present it at a major meeting at the World Conference. So that's that's also how it. And then, so where do we go from here? Well, are these data enough for regulatory authorities, or did, are future trials planned? That's not my decision, but I do believe that this is a, a, such an improvement in survival, which we have never seen before, that we should be able to provide it to our patients. So this is that. The next step that we see here would be to look into combination of TKIs, for example, small molecules that block the tyrosine kinase function with cetuximab. The next step could be in the stage three disease, where we can combine it. And the ultimate step, of course, would be to go in the advanced setting where we could try to increase the cure rate. Okay, good. Any questions? Uh, yes, please. 
I'm Katharina Arnheim from Germany, medical freelance. Um, Dr. Pirker, are these, uh, is this high expression uniformly distributed in NSCLC, not like the EGFR mutations who are predominantly found in adeno adenocarcinoma? Yeah, that's at all what, what's, it's, it's pretty much uniformly distributed. So you see it in all types, all hysteroxial subtypes. And you have pretty much in all subtypes quite a homogeneous distribution with regard to the score. If you take from zero to 300, it's homogeneously distributed. But also it then seen in all the subtypes, all histological subtypes. The only thing what we see that the EGFR high expression is slightly higher in squamous cell, or squamous cell carcinomas have a slightly higher percentage of high expression. Overall, it is roughly 30% of the patients have a positive high. And in squamous, it's in, in 40%. And that's known that squamous carcinomas have slightly higher EGFR expression. So it fits with, with the literature. And can there be an overlap between uh, patients who are uh, at the same time have EGFR mutations and a an high EGFR score? That that, of course, there can be an overlap. We had patients with, with, with mutation in our study, but I can't, all I can tell you, we have, we can't, I can't answer this question because the numbers of mutations we had in the flex study was not that high. And so it's, that, that was also not the, the, the aim of the flex study to look into the mutation impact. But that, it can be both, most probably. But we need more, that's, we, we need more data on this. Okay, last question. Thank you. So, uh, uh, Mitchell Zola from Internal Medicine News. Dr. Perker, it sounded like from the explanation you gave of what led up to this analysis, so this was uh, post hoc, non pre specified no, analysis? No, 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 that is a misunderstanding. What was done initially, that I looked it up in the protocol because I wrote the protocol, Flex. It was EG, the impact of EGF status with regard to staining frequency and staining intensity as its further efficacy or the or a correlation of efficacy with this EGFF receptor status. So that was pre-planned, that was pre-done, and it was, everything was collected, both the frequency of the staining and also the staining intensity. But the initial analysis was just focused on frequency. And then there was the pressure to look into other parameters. And because this didn't work, we came back. And the, there is no retrospective. You can now, you can now think that what we did then, of course, is the threshold to determine the threshold, and that was based on response rate. And we have chosen, a, we used response rate in both treatment arms, control arm and chemo plus cetuximab arm, and looked where they start to separate. They start to separate at a, at a, a score of 150. But there are cons there's consistent difference above 200. And to be on a more conservative approach, only treat patients who will benefit, we have chosen 200 as a cutoff. And that can be easily seen. That means at least 60 or two thirds of the patients, uh, let's say 70% uh, of the patients staining with strong intensity. And that can easily, and that's what I have shown in the slide. Thank you, Robert. If we have time.